All right, welcome back to Psychedelic Stay, everybody. I'm Kyle, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Richard, Richard Grossman. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied already. Um, sweet, so welcome to the show. Excited to have you on here. We'll talk about a little bit about your work and your work with ayahuasca. Um, do you want to give folks uh, a little background about what you do and, and what your background is? Yeah, I've, I have a very long background as working in healing starting off many years ago, macrobiotic chef, long-term practitioner of kind of a meditation since I was a teenager, and many years as a licensed acupuncturist with a practice in California, Los Angeles area. And then for the last 12 years, I've been pretty much leading ceremonies with ayahuasca and with San Pedro for the purpose of you know, spiritual, emotional, mental, and some physical healing work. Mm. And how did you get involved with working with San Pedro and Ayahuasca? Ayahuasca came to me shortly after I graduated from acupuncture school and very shortly into my attempt and success as a private practitioner. A friend of mine brought some up from Peru and said, you have to try this. And he'd had a little bit of training in Peru, very little. But he was good. He was also a long-term healer and a very dear friend of mine. And uh, my life changed in one night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The moment, the moment, uh, the moment I recognized what was happening to me, my first thought was, "This is going to be my life." And there was really no doubt in my mind about it. And then it took me many years as an acupuncturist, learning more about healing, more about the body, more about the mind, more about the spirit, to actually get to a place where I felt that I was ready to start leading ceremonies mm-hmm. as well as some time, as well as, you know, some time in Peru studying and learning there from the shamans there. Awesome. And how long ago w- did you get exposed to ayahuasca? Um, I don't actually exactly know, but about 30 years. Okay. So yeah, you've been at this for a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, sweet. And, um, so do you, do you kind of integrate your acupuncture practice uh, in ceremony, as you were saying before? Yeah, not so much uh, with ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, we do fairly traditionally. Mm. Um, Icaros, I've added in a lot of other things other than just Icaros, more modern, not popular songs by any means, but songs that have come to me during ceremonies, uh, as well as poetry from missed poets like Rumi and Kabir and Hafez. Mm. And uh, a lot of instrumental music with flutes and kalimbas and jaw harps and harmonicas and other things. Mm. So it's, I call it traditionally based because we do it in the upper Amazonian style, you know, in the dark, eyes closed, people receiving the experience, good strong medicine. And it's not participatory. Sometimes at the end we have people sing along, but the most part of it is non-participatory other than what's going on inside of the participants. You mean the so facilitators aren't really participating, they're just holding space? Facilitators are facilitating. We're, we're singing, we're playing music, we're helping people if they need help, we're you know, really monitoring the space, the assistants help people get to the bathrooms and back. And... Uh, so it's done in a traditional style, but I'm not like singing Shipibo all night or right, okay. any tribal, tribal Icaros all night. And were you trained in the uh, Shipibo tradition? I had a lot of experience with the Shipibo tradition. I was never actually an apprentice getting okay. the full-on training. Never felt right for me to do that. Mm. Did you train with specific people down in Peru or a certain yes. tribe? Yeah, many different people actually. Okay. Nice. Some so of them not, didn't. Not some of them didn't know that. Some of them didn't know that they were training me. <laughs> <laughs> but they were nice. Yeah. Cool. So not just one lineage. You kind of no. uh, a variety yeah. of teachers and, and whatnot. Yeah, everything from traditional Shipibo to Kokoma to Rio Napo to Napo Luna I mean, mm. to Mestizo to kind of much more modern styles. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. And so 
you integrate the uh, acupuncture with some more with the San Pedro. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. For the San Pedro, we do it totally non-traditionally. Mm. Uh, you know, there'll be some songs and music in the beginning, and sometimes the middle, and sometimes the end. You know, it's a long day. San Pedro's eighteen hours of work. Oh, wow. But then at some point, people become ready, and each person gets one on. Not each person always, but people that need it get one-on-one -on -one work with acupuncture, body work, counseling, um, whatever else they need, whatever mm. else we can provide. So this is like kind of post uh, ceremony as a way to- No, no, oh, no, in the middle of the ceremony. Oh, wow. Usually after about three hours. And what I found is that, you know, whereas with acupuncture in a clinic, it might take 10 sessions to get a really deep change. Mm -hmm. With the San Pedro, the change happens, or the body work, whatever it is, the change happens in one day. Right. Huh. That's, people, that's really interesting um, to do it kind of like mid session. Yeah. I don't know anybody else that's doing that. I mean, there may be people, but I, I don't know anybody else that's doing that. Yeah. How it's do really, how did you come up with that like format or idea? God, um, how did I come up with that? <laughs> I think I think what happened was somebody was having a problem, mm. and I started working on them, and it worked. Mm. And uh, I work with a partner, and she drives me pretty hard in the ceremonies. You know, it was, we did, we, the last one we did, we worked on every single person in a group of 30. Mm. And uh, it just developed naturally. It was an organic, organic growth that happened. Mm. You know, of, of here's this idea, let's see what happens. Yeah. And it worked, worked really well. And usually, usually during the process of the treating individual people, I like the group to stay together and to sit and we play recorded music during that time period. And people meditate and kind of participate in the experience of the healing indirectly, not as not actively, but just sitting in their own space, holding the space, so to speak. Mm. And uh, sometimes people want to leave and go take a walk and that's quite okay, especially if we're in a beautiful place. Yeah. Hmm. But we regroup, we regrouped several times during the day um, for music, for talk. Usually, towards the end, there's poetry. I found I found mystical poetry to be an amazing aid in ceremony work. Hmm. Amazing, amazing aid. And what do you mean by mystical poetry? Uh, people, people like in the kind of guise of Rumi and Kabir and. Hafez, no more. I really like the Sufi poetry mm. in ceremony because when you listen to the Sufi poetry, it's like here's people who have had, if not an theogenic experience, they've had very similar experiences. And so there's a real beauty in hearing that depth of wisdom that's thousands, thousand years old in a, a psychedelic experience during the right. you know. And usually there's music accompanying the poetry and it's beautiful. It's yeah. really beautiful. Yeah, it and very, beautiful. very, very profoundly affecting people as well. Mm. Very, you know, I've had the entire room crying after a poem. Mm. You know, crying joy, crying joyful tears. Cry tears of relief sometimes, you know, because there's there's the whole experience that's happening, which for most people doesn't have a real context to it. Like here's this energy, here's this feeling, here's this emotion, you know, here's this internal turmoil going on, here's this guilt, here's this shame, here's this joy, here's this bliss. All of it happens for somebody or somebody else during mm -hmm. ceremony, but then to hear the words when it's the right time, it's very, very powerful, very beautiful. Mm. So it's helping to kind of put some context to the experience you find? And take it deeper. Okay. And take it deeper. Mm. You know, and I probably have two or 300 poems I choose from 
of which there's, of course, 20 that are my fa- <laughs> favorites. <laughs> which, what are some of your favorites? Yeah. Oh, man. Kabir. See, I do, I do ceremonies with all kinds of different people. You know, different, uh, different countries, different religions, different belief systems. And I find one of the best ones for that is Kabir. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't exactly quote it, but it's something to the effect of, um, are you looking for me? I'm in the seat next to you. My shoulder is up against yours. You will not find me in churches, temples. You will not find me in mosques. You will not find me in pilgrimages to sacred places. You will not find me in doing kirtans or chanting. You won't find me in winding your leg around your own neck or needing nothing but vegetables. This is a paraphrase, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> Nor needing nothing but vegetables. When you really look for me, you will find me instantly. You will see me hiding in the tiniest house of time. Kabir says, student, tell me what is God? He is the breath inside the breath, breath within the breath. Mm. And, you know, it's like, here it is, here it is. Religion is not the path. You know, belief is not the path. Ideas is not the path. Chanting is not the path. Where is the path? The path is within the heart. So people, when they hear that, automatically, like, what's the breath inside of the breath? I'm going to you know, and there it is. There is that place inside that is the direct connection to God. Mm. And it's beautiful on medicine to have that experience. And there's many, many others. I mean, I could read poetry for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for sharing that. That is a really beautiful poem, even though, yeah, it might not be yeah. word to word. And then there's um, one, there's a, there's a roomy one that I really love. It goes, I have this one memorized. Oh, incomparable giver of life. Cut reason loose at last. Let it wander gray-eyed from vanity to vanity. Shatter open my skull. Pour in the wine of madness. Let me be mad. Mad as you. Mad with you. Mad with us. Beyond the sanity of fools lies a burning desert where your sun is whirling in every atom. Beloved, drag me there. Let me roast in your perfection. Mm. It's like, here, here you are, like, I'm going through a break, relationship breakup or I'm going through, you know, uh, somebody died or I'm going through, I don't know what I'm doing in my life and shatter open my skull, pour in the wine of madness. You know, let me do that. <laughs> let, me, let me go into that place of, the incomparable giver of life's sun whirling in every atom mm. into that experience. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> deep. <laughs> instant, instant connection with something that is outside of the realm of what most people ever consider. Mm. Process of surrendering to the power inside of us that the medicine only opens us up to. Mm-hmm. Medicine is not the power. The medicine is the key in the door. Right. It's the vehicle. And the purpose, yeah. It's the vehicle. It's, um, I look at it as the key in the door, you know, and then the door is open. You can walk through the door into that place of experience, you know, going from here to the heart, from the head to the heart, from ideas and thoughts into the experience of life itself within the human body. It's very beautiful. Yeah, that is you know, something something that most people, you know, don't contextualize in the context of a psychedelic experience. Because I hear it all the time. Well, I have visions. I want visions. I want visions. I want visions. To me, the visions are a distraction quite often. Right. You know, what's the real thing? Is the source of life, is the source of love, the source of joy, the source of peace, the source of bliss, the source of truth that's within. Mm-hmm. You know, and if a person can experience that for an instant, their life changes because it's undeniable. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do you think people seek out those visions or like, do you think it's just kind of because that's how we Facebook. talk about it or? Facebook. 
<laughs> I think because it's it's like there's a wow factor and there's all of the great psychedelic artists mm-hmm. who paint amazing visions of you know whatever it is extraterrestrial beings uh jungle animals um you know you've seen them everybody's seen them mm-hmm. and it's like well why aren't i having visions like that mm-hmm. you know why don't i see gods and goddesses in the sky yeah because that's all just an aspect of the human mind right you know we're tuning into the visual visionary aspect of the mind which is vast you know but does one's life change from seeing a flying saucer inside right and i wonder too is it the vision or is it the emotion and feeling that you feel and then the vision comes because for me i know it starts with the feeling and the emotion and the experience and then maybe i'll attach that to some sort of vision or something like that but for me it really starts with the the feeling and the emotion yeah for me it's just keep going yep the visionary state is could be likened to an astral plane Mm. You know, and everybody wants to leave their body and go into the astral, but is that the purpose? Is that really the point? Mm. Or is the point to, as has been said many times by very many people, to really know what's inside of you, mm-hmm. to really know who you are, to really, but because whatever the visionary state is, it's gonna be there, it's gonna be gone. Yep. It's temporary. But when you connect to the love inside, when you connect to the truth inside, this doesn't go away because that's what's really there. Mm-hmm. That's what's real. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the psychedelic experience is not about, for me, in my work, people can have their own experience, their own, their own way of doing it, of course. But for me, in my work, it's about going beyond the visionary state into, you know, what Kabir also said, you know, look at the lotus spinning at the heart of the universe. Mm. You know? There's not actually a lotus flower there, mm-hmm. but he's talking about that energy, that that power that is in the center of creation, which is the center of the heart. Mm. It's all about the internal experience. I I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if Joe talked to you last time, but we we both have a background in breath work, and um, I actually okay. just. I'm in Vermont right now and I just uh, finished up a, a retreat, but yeah, people typically come and, and, you know, they expect some sort of vision. And then if that didn't happen, they're like, well, nothing happened, but you know, people are often having like really powerful somatic experiences or some sort of catharsis. But since there's like no vision there, people just kind of assume nothing happened. And nothing you know, happened, it's yeah. like, well, what was happening on the inside? Did you feel anything? Were there any emotions there? I mean, that no. experience is, I think the most important not just yeah this vision that that are that we see yeah I, I, i've lost count of how many times people have said to me that um i didn't have any experience didn't see any visions and then two or three weeks later i get a letter from them well my life has completely changed <laughs> you know yeah there's a lot of things that are like happening on those subtle levels that um yeah doesn't feel like anything's happening, but something is happening on those subtle levels. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like t- there's, there's, I kind of, kind of look at it as the difference between the psychonaut experience of seeking the vision, seeking the out of body, seeking the astral, seeking the wow factor as one aspect of working with entheogens and psychedelics the actual, the healing process is something quite different though, Mm. you know, because it is one of the, one of the things that I often sing in, in um, ayahuasca ceremonies is the Heart Sutra of Buddha, which is, you know, it ends with gate, gate, paragate, paragate, bodhisattva, beyond, beyond, the beyond, go beyond the beyond, Mm. beyond, beyond, beyond the beyond, beyond the beyond, hail to the one who goes there. You know, so are we tapping into a brain discharge or an experience of deeper levels of the subconscious or unconscious mind and or unconscious mind? Or are we able in the context of a ceremony to go beyond the beyond, to go 
beyond the beyond the beyond, you know, to go infinitely deep into experience. Mm. This to me is where the healing happens because to go there, you have to let go of everything. You have to let go of the thoughts, of the emotions, of the fear, of the wanting, of the need, you know, all the things that impel a person into doing medicine work. Mm. You have to let go of all of those and go into a place of total surrender to the experience and not even getting caught up. You know, I tell people, if you see Ganesh and you see Krishna and you see Shiva and you see, you know, whatever, just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going deeper into the core of creation, which is the heart, which is in the breath. Just keep going. And to do that, you have to let go of all of the ideas. Right. All ideas have to go. You know, and I see a lot of ideas in the psychedelic community. Mm. A lot. You know, but what is it to let go of the ideas, to let go of the want, to let go of the need for the visions? and really do that very intense journey from here to here. Mm. Do you have any examples of some of these ideas that you've been observing? Oh, you know, the whole, the whole Hindu pantheon is a big one. Mm. You know, people want to see Krishna, they want to see Shiva, they want to, you know, in a lot of ceremony places, do a lot of chanting to bring in Saraswati, Ganesh, you know, Lakshmi, all these people, all these gods and goddesses, I should mm. say. And it's an overlay. It's something that's placed upon experience. You know, if you see it, it's cool, but just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. How deep can a human being go? In my mind, in my experience, this is an infinite journey. There is no place where it's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. If you see the white light of creation, it can get deeper and deeper and deeper. You know. Huh. And what is it like to go deeper and deeper and deeper? Do you have like an example on how somebody could potentially do something like that in, in an experience? Well, for, my, for myself, I can only talk about me yeah. here because I'm the only person I really know right. in, this, in the internal world. So, you know, whenever I do ceremony, I am very far from perfect in my internal world. I've been working on myself my entire life practically, but there's still so much more to go. So I can be sitting, feeling the medicine beginning to take effect. And my thought process will start usually. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? You know, at that point, I breathe. If I'm singing, I sing. You know, whatever I'm doing, I do it more. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as though if you can imagine a series of curtains parting over and over and over again. Like, here's, here's a place of illusion. Here's a place of illusion. I'm thinking about my work. I'm thinking about a relationship. I'm thinking about a friend. I'm thinking about this thing or that thing. Okay, breathe, go deeper. You know, I start seeing colors and patterns. Breathe, go deeper. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'll start having visions. Breathe, go deeper. And you know, there's like waves of it, up and down, up and down during the course, especially the ayahuasca ceremony. Machuma also has many waves to it. And as I'm doing my own work, in the context of leading the ceremony, the waves start to smooth with Mm. time until all there is is me sitting there. There's nothing else going on. No thoughts, no vision. The medicine's still strong, mind you. Right. No thoughts, no visions, just this overwhelming, beautiful state of what I would call love. Mm. And that is phenomenally healing Mm -hmm. for a human being to experience. You know, it's like karma, the the impressions on our mind, the impressions on our spirit from this lifetime alone, but throw in an infinite number of past lifetimes as well. You know, the impressions, the wounds, the injuries, 
are deep. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nobody here who's clean that I've right. met so far. You know, there's nobody here who's coming in with a blank slate, you know. So, you know, as, as like, for example, my first very strong ayahuasca experience, I was um, sitting there listening to some music with my uh, person who was guiding me sitting on the other side of the room, just letting me do my thing. And I ended up, this was very powerful and very strange, I ended up in a Nazi concentration camp. Mm. You know, my background is Eastern European Jew, and although none of my relatives that I know of went through that, I was there. I was there. And so here I am in this really profound, awful, bad trip, you know, in quotes, mm -hmm. visionary state. And what do I do? You know, so I'm watching this, and it was 3D real. Mm -hmm. It was 3D real. And this voice came in and said, trust and forgive. Mm. And that wasn't really what I wanted to hear. You know, to forgive this, to trust this, you know, wasn't really what I wanted to hear. Yeah. But I sat there processing that. What does forgiveness mean? What does trust mean? How am I able to trust an experience that's awful? Mm. And I wasn't like yelling in the screen. I was like sitting very calmly like, hmm, okay, this is really interesting, you know. <laughs> and when I got to a place where I realized that trust and forgiveness meant totally letting go of any connection, emotional, mental, et cetera, that I had, not only to that vision, but to that experience, to that ancestral or tribal experience, you know, then it just went, <sighs> and dissolved and I was just sitting there until the next one started and this went back many 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 ages you know mm -hmm. and when it was finished I was just sitting there in a state of joy and peace feeling like 10,000 tons of garbage had been lifted from my shoulders mm. you know was that real was it not real was it past lifetime was it I don't care it doesn't matter. I don't want to put labels on anything. Right. But I know because I was experiencing that, it was in me someplace. Mm -hmm. The connection to those experiences was in me. It could have been my imagination. It doesn't matter. But whatever it was, is it was in my subconscious mind or in my you know, field, let's say. And by actually releasing it and letting go of it, by forgiveness, by letting go of any emotional, mental, psychic connection to those visions, profound healing occurred for me. Mm. Profound healing. And, you know, whether it's that or whether it's, you know, a trauma from this lifetime, war, you know, rape, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it only all exists as memory. Right. It only all exists in the mind or our memories, you know, you can't say that the mind is vast and it encompasses something more than just the brain. That's not important to me in this context. Mm -hmm. What's important is that if something like that comes up in the context of a ceremony, even dreams, even thoughts, etc., it means that something is there that is not clean, that is not healed. So the, you know, ayahuasca especially, it's like, here it is, what do you want to do with this? I can write stories about it. I can create a religion about it. I can do a lot of things with it. Or I can release it, let go. Mm. Where's the most benefit? Releasing and letting go, letting it heal. Letting the past become the past. Whatever the occurrence was. Mm. Now, through a fairly severe childhood trauma, there was a whole series of ceremonies that were around this. You know, I finally healed when I went, okay, enough. I'm letting it go. I am not going to participate in this anymore. And I don't need to participate in it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's all just memories. Memories of memories of memories of memories of memories. And, you know, if I was sitting there with 
visions, you know, I want my visions. I could just ignore the whole process of healing. Mm -hmm. I want to see the snakes in the jungle and jaguars and fly <laughs> like an eagle. And I want to do this and that. And medicine will quite often give you that as an entertainment. Mm. You know, but when you really get down to the work, it's all about forgiveness. It's all about releasing because I don't, I don't care, you know, I don't care so much what experience a person has in ceremony. I do, obviously. I mean, you're not right. gonna, yeah. I take really good care of people, you know, yeah. but I don't really care what their experience is in ceremony. I care how they are two or three weeks or two or three months or two or three years later. Right. What are you doing with it? And yeah, uh, how are you how's your life? How's their life changed? How's mm -hmm. their life changed? You know, and it's a path, it's a process that can take many, many, many ceremonies. Yeah. 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 yeah over the weekend, I just, my breathwork session kind of went through the same sequence of like digging through all this stuff and realizing like, I don't need to continue to participate in this and this karma that I think I'm, I'm, I, I'm like suffering from, like, do I really need to participate in this anymore? Like I can let it go. I don't, I don't need to keep yeah. doing this to myself. And it was really yeah. interesting. And, it's really not that experience, but just I've been thinking a lot about just what is healing in general, um, and especially in terms of this whole kind of psychedelic uh, renaissance and how these things are starting to get out there and people are seeking healing. And coming back to this, that, that first poem that you spoke of, um, of it's within the breath of the breath. I, I was just wrapping up a conversation with uh, our breathwork teacher, Lenny, and, you know, he was talking about, um, you know, some of the, the negative effects of ayahuasca tourism and, um, you know, just how it's like, could be destroying some of the land down there and, you know, some of those negative impacts and that people are just seeking these ex they're seeking spirituality and an external factor and sometimes really not looking within and, and really feeling within we kind of put it out there and we go to these special places to, um, you know, think that we're going to find who we are. And, you know, sometimes that happens, but do we necessarily need to all the time? Mm. Well, let me just say that I would vastly prefer to see a hundred hectares bought up for an ayahuasca retreat than mined for gold or drilled for oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Ultimate, that's a good point. It's the ultimate, <laughs> ultimate fate or, you know, logged for, patio furniture. Mm -hmm. It's the ultimate fate of the Amazon. So I look at this thing that people, you know, snidely call ayahuasca tourism as being a fairly good thing, mm. as long as it's being done with integrity and clean and cleanliness. Mm -hmm. You know, because to grow ayahuasca, you need a jungle. Right. You know, to grow chakruna, you need the jungle. To have a ceremony retreat place in the jungle, you need the jungle to be there. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's leading to, you know, going back to Dennis McKenna's idea that ayahuasca is the ambassador from the natural world trying to save itself mm -hmm. by awakening us to the miracle of what nature actually is. Mm -hmm. And to value the jungle as the jungle, not as a resource to be raped. You know? mm -hmm. So of course. If somebody's going and just chopping down ayahuasca indiscriminately, it's a really bad thing. If somebody's harvesting ayahuasca, planting new ayahuasca, I think that's a good thing in the yeah. long run. I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, th and this is interesting because we did talk to Dennis about this as well. And I think there is kind of like that narrative out there that um, a lot of this ayahuasca tourism has been having negative effects. But, you know, also the positives, as you're pointing out, people are going down there. They're kind of keeping these traditions alive and, you know, replanting ayahuasca. Yeah. And, you know, even that idea of ayahuasca wants to escape the jungle, you know, and it's growing in different parts of the world now, like Hawaii yes. and, and whatnot. So, yeah. Um, Ayahuasca is a really good tourist. <laughs> <laughs> she wants to explore. Yeah, I think I think in the long run it's going to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as integrity is there. I mean, I'm I'm much more concerned about women going down there and getting abused by shamans than I right. am about yeah. the jungle being destroyed by ayahuasca tourism. I think ayahuasca tourism is going to save the jungle, or at mm -hmm. least help to save it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but I guess just that idea of like going to seek um, when really sometimes those experiences are within like necessarily maybe we don't have to go all over the world and go to every little place to to try and find healing no definitely i mean it's that's part of that poem is you're not going to find it in pilgrimages mm -hmm. but at the same time i mean the value that i got out of being in the jungle is immense mm -hmm. it was changed my life so that's something that i think needs to be appreciated as well yeah, yeah there's certainly. nothing nothing really Nothing wrong. I mean, we could talk about carbon footprint of a jet airplane, you know, that mm -hmm. jet airplanes are going to fly anyway. And the ayahuasca, people going down to the jungle for ayahuasca is a tiny, 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 tiny fraction. Yeah. Jet travel. <laughs> so, and if somebody goes down to the jungle to, you know, experience ayahuasca and they have their heart opened up, they have deeper appreciation for nature, they decide to maybe even try to help do something about that. Mm -hmm. That's ayahuasca's work, you know, as mm -hmm. an ambassador from the plant kingdom mm -hmm. to help save, you know, these monkeys that have gotten out of control <laughs> from destroying the entire world. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I wasn't specifically targeting ayahuasca in general for, for that um, example. It was just an example he used, but just the, um, yeah, the idea of constantly seeking, constantly seeking. Yeah, so yeah. how do how do we um, come back to the inner experience and find that healing within, instead of projecting it out onto the external world and thinking that you know we'll ultimately find it there if we continue to seeking these external things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Ultimately, it has to be an internal seeking. Mm -hmm. That's the that's where the game is. That's where everything is. Mm -hmm. You know, we are what we've been looking for, you know, as Marianne Williamson said. Mm. We are the people we've been looking for. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I, that's why I love the Sufi poetry so much, because it's always, you know, here's this, 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 but it's really inside of you. It's really inside of you. This is where the friend is. This is where God is. This is where the experience is. It's inside of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could spend my lifetime going on pilgrimages from sacred site to sacred site. And, you know, I have some really cool pictures. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some good bragging rights. And probably really wonderful experiences. Really wonderful experiences, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the journey from here to here, from the head brain to the heart brain, is the deepest journey a human being can take. And you'll never get this from any place external. Right. You might get reflections of it that you feel while you're there, but then you have to leave. Yeah, you got to go back home and... Go back yeah. home and make some money for the next one, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So how would you define, I guess, like the, a healing process or what is healing to you? Well, you know, it's it's complex subject. It is. Yeah. It's a complex subject. Um, I like, like the idea of a series of concentric circles. I think this came out of homeopathy. Mm -hmm. On the outside is our skin. On the outside of that is our energetic field, but on the outside is our skin. You know, oftentimes diseases will manifest on the skin, but it's also oftentimes the process of the disease from the internal coming out. And, you know, then we get into, oh, this is so complex. Yeah. Um, you know, the internal organs, the food we eat, the thoughts we have, you know, going deeper and deeper in, into what is our connection with our soul? What is our connection with self? So, you know, obviously, if somebody has a skin disease, you're going to get the right plants or the right medicine to treat the skin disease. Mm -hmm. That's one level of healing. If somebody has an ulcer, you want to treat the ulcer. If somebody has cancer, you want to treat the cancer if you can. Whatever it is, you're working physical first. And then comes what's the cause? Is the cause diet? Is the cause emotions? Is the cause thoughts? Is the cause 
heredity. You know, for me, that's the second stage is working on more of the thoughts, the emotions, the ideas, and then going down into the core of it, which is the connection of self with self. That's where mm -hmm. the deepest healing occurs. And somebody can have a beautiful, strong connection of their self with their self and still die from a disease. Right. That's not what it's about. It's not about living forever. It's about living in the moment. So multi-layered, multi-layered. I mean, you know, I can say there's the whole acupuncture world, there's herbs, all of these things help in the healing process. But ultimately, it's self with self. It's that connection, that depth. Mm -hmm. Can we put this on pause for a second? Yeah. Somebody's really trying to reach me here. I'm just ready. All right, cool. Back. Um, let, I, I kind of want to, yeah, jump back to this, uh, like your work with acupuncture um, within the San Pedro ceremonies. I think that's really interesting. So are you working with the person's like energy there? And, and what, what type of things are you seeing when you're working with people um, during that? Okay. What I see with my eyes is the person gets very relaxed. Mm. And sometimes I'll just, somebody who can't relax and surrender to the experience, I'll just stick needles in them so they can't move anymore. Mm. You know, somebody who's like pacing or, you know, really like having conversations with themselves a lot. I'll just stop it, you know, with the acupuncture. But what I really see with my eyes is somebody gets very relaxed, very centered. Um, accepts the experience they're having. Energetically, I work in a system that I find what's weak and strengthen what's weak, or bring into balance what's out of balance. Mm. And so afterwards, you know, somebody, God, I've seen so many amazing things. Illness is healed, you know. Yeah. Women, women who were infertile becoming fertile after a ceremony, things, things like that are really powerful to see, but and it's just bringing the person back into an energetic balance, mm -hmm. which we should all be in anyway, but we're not. Right. And coming from like that Chinese medicine background, um, do you view intoxicants, uh, quote unquote, maybe with like uh, San Pedro or marijuana and stuff like that, like affects the chi or like really disrupts the energy within? Because I remember when I used to go get acupuncture done, you know, it was always like, don't indulge in you know, you know, any intoxicants or do anything like this, because it can really kind of disrupt your, your energy when you come in for a session. Yeah, I don't consider San Pedro or ayahuasca to be intoxicants. Okay. I consider like, them to be unquote. healing. Yeah. yeah, I consider them to be healing plants. We get into stuff like alcohol and marijuana and, you know, a lot of the chemist or chemical uh, things. They can definitely be intoxicants and have damage to the body mm -hmm. not so much marijuana but even that has its positives and negatives mm -hmm. um, ayahuasca i see only as being good for the body mm -hmm. you know all of the studies that have been done trying to find something wrong with it have come up empty-handed mm -hmm. and you know what i felt in my own body is i'm pretty much as vital as i was 20 years ago mm -hmm. you know, my level of vitality my level of energy Wow. And my level of my outlook on life is very positive. And it wouldn't be that without those, without ayahuasca and San Pedro, I know that. Mm. It wouldn't be anywhere near what I am now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I recommend people don't take any intoxicants for two, two weeks to a month before ceremony and for that long afterwards. Mm -hmm. Don't often get total compliance with that you know, right people that comply with it get the benefit of it mm -hmm. yeah. and I, I, I look at ayahuasca at ayahuasca and san pedro and to some extent Iboga as being in a different universe than marijuana or mdma or lsd or something what about psilocybin it has a rough effect on the liver from huh. what i've seen um it depends on the way it's used Again, you know, is it being used ceremonially for healing or is it being taken to trip out? Right. I guess it does kind of have more of a recreational history versus ayahuasca. Yeah. yeah. So it, you've seen research that it's a little bit rough on the liver? 
Do you know any more about that? It's my, it's my own. Whenever I've done psilocybin, my liver is oh, okay. hurt afterwards. Mm. And I've talked to other people with the same experience. Mm. Yeah, I don't have any research on that. Hmm. That'd be interesting. And you don't feel that way when you um, drink ayahuasca? Never. Hmm. No, never. Yeah, I mean, ayahuasca, it's one of the reasons I don't like the chemical, what do they call it, pharmawasca world. Because right. there's so much in ayahuasca that's so tremendously beneficial for the body. Mm -hmm. Even some of the texts to remove the tannins, the tannins are valuable. Hmm. They bind toxins in the body. Hmm. And what so, about Wachuma? Wachuma, I've not felt anything negative from either. Um, it's a bit, seems like it could be a bit harsher on the body than ayahuasca because mm -hmm. it has that stimulant property to it. Right. But putting it into balance, the benefit far outweighs the negativities, mm -hmm. any negative that might be there. Do you have to worry about any like heart conditions when um, working with San Pedro? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a stimulant. It's got that method, methadrine ring inside of it, amphetamine ring, I mean, mm -hmm. inside of it. So I'm very careful with people that I work with uh, as far as you know, screening them beforehand for safety. And if I don't think it's going to be safe, we do something else. Mm. And do you usually... Yeah, combined like uh, when you were when you do ceremonies do ayahuasca and then maybe do wachuma afterwards yeah awesome. yeah that's my preference cool. powerful <laughs> yeah i powerful. heard that the wachuma is like really grounding after yeah. ayahuasca ceremony yeah it's really beautiful mm. really beautiful even just to sit on the earth you know, to feel the earth and to See nature. To me, uh, like ayahuasca, I always recommend eyes closed. San Pedro, eyes closed, but eyes open too, mm -hmm. if you're in a beautiful place. And is so, that one that you do at night or do you, would you do it during the day? I do it during the day. During the day. Mm. I know some people prefer it at night, but to me, it's so beautiful during the day. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And beauty, beauty itself is a healing process. You know, beauty heals. Mm hmm and certainly there's no, no point in trying to avoid beauty if it's there. Mm -hmm. Beauty inside, beauty outside, and the beauty on the inside and the beauty on the outside meet. Then you're talking, you know, and you're really, really going someplace amazing. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you're excited about in the, in the psychedelic world? I'm, I'm excited about the research that's happening now, you know, basically saying what we've known for years, right. that this is good for you. Mm -hmm. This stuff is healing. It's not, it's not a bad thing to take these substances, these plants, that it's a good thing. When it's done correctly, mm -hmm. is what I would add to that. I would hate to see somebody go onto eBay and buy an ayahuasca kit and drink it at home by themselves. <laughs> I think that's a recipe for serious trouble. Mm -hmm. But I love the ceremonial structure. I love how that works. I love the community coming together to heal. You know, I, I think it's such an important thing. And then when the community comes together to heal, the community becomes really large. Like somebody told me that any given weekend in California, there's hundreds of ayahuasca ceremonies going on now. I can imagine. So, it's a big community mm -hmm. that's forming. We may not all be sitting in the same circle or even the same tradition, but we're all going ideally to a place of more love, more peace, more joy, mm. more healing. And you know, I don't. I, I can. I can wax very philosophical about this, but you know, when you get into the idea of one plus one equals more than two. What are we, what are we creating in doing this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my idea in this work especially is like if you have, and I know this is not accurate, I'm taking artistic liberty here, okay? You have a flock of geese flying someplace. The goose in the front is leading. 
and the goose geese behind him are basically looking at the ass of the goose in front of them. I know this is not accurate, you yeah. know, but <laughs> for the purposes of this conversation. So the goose in front of the flock of humans has been going in the wrong direction. Mm. Been going into conflict, going into prejudice, going into racism, going into anger and hatred and war and ecological devastation and lack of respect for nature, lack of respect for each other. You know, what if all of these ceremonies are taking the goose in the front and changing who that is? Mm. The geese in the back are still looking at the ass in front of them. Right. You know, but maybe the flock is starting to shift direction shift, shift. into something more in harmony. Mm. That's what I think, that's what I, my personal fantasy <laughs> of this work is, is that we are changing something fundamental in the uh, group unconsciousness, the group, the group consciousness of humanity, step mm -hmm. by step slowly. So there's 400 ceremonies on a weekend in Los Angeles. How many are there in the world right now? Thousands I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's amazing, um, you, know. you know, people telling me that it's happening in different parts. I'm like, hmm, interesting, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> people are coming out of the woodwork and I'm like, yeah. I had no idea that existed, like ceremonies were happen happening here. Every place, every, every place. place, yeah. You know, we look back 2000 years to like Jesus, Jesus had a experience of self-realization, you know, of really knowing God within. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven is within. Father and I are one. People turn that into a really strange religion. Mm -hmm. But if you look back on it, he had some kind of, not necessarily plant-based maybe, but he had an experience of the divine within himself. Mm -hmm. And the power that that had to change the world with mistakes made on the way, obviously, yeah. by, other, by his followers. But, you know, what's the power of thousands of people having an experience of love, of joy, of peace, of healing? You know, maybe it can change the direction. Maybe it can save us. Maybe ayahuasca is an ambassador from the more ancient and much wiser kingdom of the plants, mm. looking at the monkeys that have gotten out of control and saying, I want to help you guys. <laughs> I want you to be happy. I want you to dance and sing and, you know, be in joy and not be in conflict and hatred and anger all the time. Mm -hmm. What if that's the purpose of this? It's beautiful. You know, it's really beautiful. Yeah. We can only hope it's, that, that, that changes. Yeah. And yeah, I always think about like even the subtleties, like we're on the subtle level on how things change and shift. You know, yeah. It's interesting. Are there it's any, <laughs> yeah, it keeps me optimistic. <laughs> yeah. The more everybody kind of starts engaging in this, that things will slowly start to shift. Um, yeah. are, is there anything that you feel cautious about now that this stuff, is, like psychedelics, are starting to hit the mainstream, and or maybe like w an idea of where you would like to see this go? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've, there's a lot of cautions. I mean, there's. I've heard and seen people who go down to the jungle for a couple of weeks and come back and they change their name to shaman this or that and start leading ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is a bit of a recipe for an eventual disaster, possibility of an eventual disaster. Um, and obviously the ceremony structure is morphing and changing into something that is not the jungle structure anymore, not the jungle tradition anymore. I think that's, that's inevitable is that it's going to grow and morph and change. I don't want to see it change too much. Like I don't want to see ayahuasca raves happening. Right. You know, I don't want to, I just don't want to see that, you know, and I know people have attempted this. Hmm. Some guy was wanting to do the largest ayahuasca ceremony ever. And I think that's ridiculous because it's, it should be small. It should be community. It should be from the heart in a controlled setting. Um, What's small to you? Small to me. Mm -hmm. under, under 30 people under the year under mm -hmm. yeah that's the most i go yeah uh, i mean i've done i've done more on new year's eve once you know that it was beautiful but it wasn't the same yeah you know i had a lot of assistance helping mm -hmm. but i think i think in the context of a shamanic ayahuasca oh. ceremony or san pedro ceremony 
20 to 30 should be the tops. Tops, yeah. That's for somebody who's really experienced at doing it. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Stuff, I, go, stuff can go crazy. Stuff can go crazy. Yeah, Joe and I went down to Jamaica. We had 21 participants there for um, the mushroom retreat. And, you know, that felt like a lot to contain. So I, I would agree maybe yeah. like topsing it off at like 20, 30. And, you know, we had a yeah. lot of help too. So it was good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the ayahuasca ceremony structure really contains it well for me. You know, the constant songs or music, the really paying attention to what people are going through, trying to stop things from going totally wonky in the beginning before they go totally wonky. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there's quite often a point in a ceremony for me where it's like, this can go in either direction now, you know, this can go into total group insanity or it can go into total group healing and you know thank god it's always gone into total group healing or almost always gone into total group healing have you had an experience where it went into group insanity a couple you know what is that like i don't want to talk about it <laughs> okay that's fair yeah yeah it wasn't pretty mm -hmm. and you know i've taken great safeguards after those really just two times mm -hmm. in you know, many years of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, I've taken great safeguards to make sure that it can't happen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. But yeah, it can be dangerous. It can mm -hmm. be dangerous. People have been killed during ayahuasca ceremonies in Peru. Mm -hmm. You know, so people have to respect, have a great deal of respect for the medicine. I think that's, that to me is, is the deepest issue is looking at it as something to be respected with a consciousness with its own spirit you know again like ayahuasca to me is not what's in the cup it's what the cup opens you up to to the world of ayahuasca to the spirit to the consciousness and intelligence of this amazing being this amazing consciousness call it um if respect for that is lost and it becomes, you know, hey, dude, let's do some ayahuasca tonight and make a YouTube on it, which has been done, you know, yep. it's been done. I think it's missing the point, and I think that's a very sad way to use these sacred medicines. Mm. You know, so respect, um, I think, at least holding close to the tradition for a few generations is important. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it's really important. Plus, I love. I love that tradition. I love the way the ceremony works. It's mm -hmm. nothing better. You know, there's always a point during a ceremony where I'm sitting there and I think to myself, this is the most beautiful, perfect place to be in the entire universe. Mm. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. You know, it's that beautiful, that delicious. Mm. Not talking about the taste, obviously. Right, it's that right. Delicious. The experience. The experience is that delicious. And, you know, of course, the this is standing on thousands of years of use. Mm. You know, I, I asked, a friend of mine asked a Shipibo healer once, what do, you, what do you guys do when we're not here, when the gringos aren't here making things crazy? They said, we drink. We sit in the middle of the Maloka, put our heads together and sing. Mm. Chant. No drama. Drama's not necessary. You know, our culture wants the drama. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dude, I threw up all night, you know, it was great, you know, but, <laughs> but that's not the point. The point always for me is what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Can we create beauty? Does the music create beauty? Mm -hmm. Do the songs create beauty? You know, does the silence create beauty? That's a good ceremony. Mm -hmm. That's a good ceremony. And, you know, one of, the, one of the things about the traditional Amazonian world that I dislike is the whole, you know, this is being done to you by a black magician, by a brujo, by a sorcerer, and you have to take this off of you and send it back to them. And there's this whole, like, cosmic war going on in some of the, for some of the people down there. And I think that's something that we need to outgrow. You know, externalizing, externalizing the blame. Mm. That's an interesting topic, and I would probably love to talk to you another time about that because it's yeah. sure. Um, but that's interesting. Do you still see a lot of that happening down there? 
I stopped going to the jungle six, seven years ago now. Okay. And I would stop going because I was getting really tired of that. Yeah. And it just seemed like this, this guys, this isn't the point. Right. And the point is beauty and love. Mm-hmm. You know, the point is getting through all of the shit that's there. Cleansing, cleansing, Olympia, Olympia, Olympia. You know, Olympia, cleanse the heart, cleanse the mind, cleanse the body. Why? Because it's fun, you know, it's fun to be in a healed place. Much mm-hmm. more fun than being in drama, much more fun than being in, you know, illness, much more fun than being in sadness or depression or anger. You know, this life is meant to be enjoyed. Definitely. It's, it's, and it's magical. Even more so, even more so, life itself is meant to be enjoyed. Yes. You know, the life in our heart is meant to be enjoyed. If we're not doing that, it doesn't matter what the visions are. It doesn't matter how much ayahuasca you drank last week. It doesn't matter how long you per. None of it matters. Mm-hmm. If you're not enjoying the experience of life within yourself. Mm-hmm. Breath work, meditation, whatever it is, whatever the pathway there is. You know, it all, all works synergistically to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, it's just waking me up to this is all magic. I mean, to wake up every day and enjoy every moment. I mean, that's, yeah. what more could you ask for? I know there's a lot of suffering happening in the world and it gets hard, but I mean, yeah. to really contemplate what you're doing here. And I mean, this is, you know, here, here's the, th- here's the thing about the suffering in the world is, you know, I, I went through this, like, what am I doing being so joyful during these ceremonies when people are, you know, so many places in the world people are suffering and you know the answer that i got that i came to is no matter how much i suffer it's not going to help mm-hmm. you know suffering to heal suffering just doesn't work right you know but if more and more people are experiencing joy respect love consciousness conscience you know more people are naturally experiencing that you know, there's a lot of inertia, but maybe it's opening up a pathway to the end of suffering, um, the end of needless suffering at some point. Because, you know, one of my dreams I love to do this is to work with world leaders. Mm. You know, here you go. This is the way it could be. This is the way your nation could be. It doesn't have to be horrible. The horrible stuff was created by humans. We've created, we've created hell on this planet, Mm -hmm. and we can create heaven on this planet. Yeah, maybe not with angels and harps and shit. I hope not. (laughs) No, but but with respect and with love and with looking at each other and recognizing the divine within Mm. human being. Do you think there's a guilt of? being happy and and feeling pleasure for normal people it seems like culture just seems to dwell on the suffering and this and that instead of maybe feeling it's like i don't know sometimes when i'm in those ecstatic states like some of that guilt feel comes up and like "Mm." i I wonder if that's a pretty cultural conditioning thing (laughs) this is a story from the wisest person i've ever met Mm. (laughs) somebody asked him what the worst sin is what the worst thing a human being can possibly do is, and they were of course expecting to get told that it was everything they've done in their life. And this teacher said, feeling guilty is the worst sin Mm. because guilt can't fly and God wants you to fly. Right. Not literally fly, but fly inside. Mm -hmm. God wants us to be in joy. Mm -hmm. God's nature is joy. I'm not talking about some dude up in heaven with strings and shit. Right. <laughs> Excuse me for using that word. Oh, no but worries. Strings and stuff. Strings and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, not talking about any kind of anthropomorphic, anthropogenic God, mm-hmm. but the ultimate experience that a human being can have is perfect. You know, in, in uh, Vedic tradition, it's called Sat Chitananda, pure truth, pure consciousness, pure bliss. Mm-hmm. You know, that is 
where the creator of this universe, the instigator of the Big Bang, wants us to be. Mm. And not wanting us to be in any kind of human wanting us to be. Because mm-hmm. it's not, not us, you know. That would be a God created in human image. Mm-hmm. Which is all too easy to do. But the nature of reality is joy. Mm-hmm. The nature of reality is love. It takes a lot of love to make a universe. Yeah. It takes a lot of love to make a world. Mm-hmm. And it takes a lot of love to be human, to be really human. And so if you have an entheogenic or psychedelic experience and it turns you into a human being with more love in your heart, you then become automatically, potentially, part of the solution to the human condition. You know, if you become a human being who's more guilty and more paralyzed from the guilt and unable to accomplish anything in your life other than going to a job and having a two-week vacation a year if you're lucky, you know, you're part of part of the misery. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's that's a universe that was created or a world that was created from some fundamental mistakes our ancestors made a long time ago. Mm-hmm. You know, it could have been in the garden, could have stayed in the garden. Right. You know, could have stayed in a in harmony with nature and our, each other and ourselves. But mm-hmm. you know, as Doris Lessing said, the monkeys got out of control. Yeah. This reminds me of a quote I heard from a teacher of mine. Um, just don't dim your light to make others feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. There's no need for guilt. I mean, if if you know, if I'm acting in a way that's overtly selfish. You know, I can feel guilty about that. Mm-hmm. If I'm acting in a way that harms other people, I should feel guilty about that. But if I'm working, you know, on the self, on my own relationship with myself, bringing more joy and love into my life, there's no room for guilt there. Mm-hmm. There just isn't. Because, you know, that old cliche, what's the power of a lit candle lighting other candles? Mm. You can't light another candle unless you're lit. Right. You can't give a person love unless you have love. You know, to me, the solution for all of the world's ills right now is love and consciousness mm-hmm. and awareness and the being willing to let go of the things that don't work. But to do that, love has to be the guideline. Love has to be the point of, is what I'm doing in harmony with love? Mm-hmm. Is what I'm doing in harmony with truth. Yeah. If I'm feeling love, naturally, I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to hurt. Naturally, it doesn't have to be a commandment. You know, one one poet, uh, Rabia Al Basri, said, um, "You know, people created religion because they couldn't handle the full truth of love." Mm. I'm, I'm really paraphrasing now. Yeah. This is something like this, she said, you know, and so people created religion hmm. to put a context into an experience that they couldn't fully accept into their lives. Hmm. Psychedelics and theogens, like, here you go, here it is. Here's that experience that you can at least, at the very least, use as a guiding light. If I'm in the full on experience of deep, magic and beauty of the world of ayahuasca i can't stay there mm-hmm. I, don't want, I don't want to stay there you know i do actually but you know i can't i can't without abusing the medicine right but if i have that it becomes to me like is what i'm doing in my life in harmony with love or not and after doing this work i mean i can't get away with much mm. Yeah. Stray thought comes in. It's like, mm, nope. Yeah. Don't go there. You know, I get pissed off at Trump. Nope. Don't go there. <laughs> I go there. Yeah. But I'm trying to go there with consciousness. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're, yeah, we're over an hour. So um, cool. we'll start wrapping up. 
any last, I don't know, bits of advice or anything that you want to say, or do you have any events? Where can people find you? I have a website, um, heartfeather.com that, uh, tells a lot about what I do, where I am, sometimes where I am. Um, I have a Facebook page. People can find me on Facebook. Richard Grossman, something, I don't know, but if you put Richard Grossman in, you'll find me. And uh, very easy to reach in any way. Um, as far as last bits of words of wisdom is don't stop. Don't stop. I like it. Just keep going. Just keep going on an infinite journey every step is the first step mm. so don't stop that's beautiful yeah. thanks so much and thanks for your time it was really great chatting with you and love to have you back awesome. on love to all right great. take care thank you take care